Um, I've had a long and largely very enjoyable productive relationship with the Royal College of Radiologists. The only bit that I is slightly different is when they made me do some exams, which are very, very difficult, but uh, those are done. Um, and it's a real pleasure to talk about this topic, which is very close to my heart, actually, uh, and essentially the um, research area that I've devoting, I am devoting my career to. So I'm hoping these slides are going to advance. And there we go. Okay, um, before I get to that, any of you who are interested in social media, uh, we, has, as a community, uh, to try and raise the profile of radiotherapy drug, drug combinations, have registered a hashtag, RT drug combo. Uh, please feel free to use. And also for tonight, the RCR Talks hashtag. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about drug treatments and why we need to think about alternative or additional ways to try and tackle cancer treatment. So we all know about drug treatments for cancer, and probably most of you think of drug treatments when you're thinking about treatments for, for people you know or um, the public with cancer. And it's true that we've made massive steps forward in how to use or design drugs for cancer. But it's actually a fact that many people are unaware of that drug treatments are actually very rarely curative. And this is despite some of these really exciting advances that have happened in the last 20 years. And here's a really good example of that. So this is a fantastic piece of science. This gentleman here, a young, fit gentleman, developed a melanoma skin cancer which spread all around his body and you can see all those metastases under the skin. And if the um, pathologists looked at his cancer, they could see that there was a particular mutation called BRAF, in a gene called BRAF, which was actually responsible for that cancer and was driving the growth of that cancer. And so they went to the labs and developed a drug which specifically targeted that mutation. And it worked. And you can see that extraordinary response that this patient had from taking this drug for just a few weeks, really. All these deposits melted away. And you can see that he's put on weight and essentially looks back to normal. But as he continued to take the drug, you can see what happened next. All of those cancers grew back again. And that's because the cancer cells hadn't been eradicated by that treatment. And the ones that had survived had found ways around it. They'd become resistant and they'd started growing again. So we do have a lot of drugs that are very effective in some ways. We see the tumours shrinking, but they almost always grow back again. So we're not curing these patients. And that's quite different from radiotherapy. Because radiotherapy is a curative treatment for many, many tens of thousands of patients every year in the UK. So we can cure patients with lung cancer, with cancers of the head and neck region. This example is a tonsil cancer that's spread to the lymph glands in the neck that is still curable. Many thousands of men with prostate cancer are cured by radiotherapy. And women with cervix cancer, which has spread up to the lymph glands in the pelvis, can still be cured with radiotherapy. So why is that different from the drug treatment? Well, the main thing, sorry, that's the wrong way. The main difference is that we are anatomically targeting our treatment with radiotherapy. When we give a drug, it circulates around the whole body, so all of the tissues are exposed to that drug. And that means we're limited in how much we can give. But with radiotherapy, we're very precisely targeting a particular part of the body where that tumour is. So we can give much more intensive treatment. And in that way, we have an opportunity to actually eradicate all of the tumour cells with our initial treatment. So we generally will give a course of maybe four to six weeks of treatment. And for many of these cancers, that's sufficient to eradicate all of those tumour cells. So there's no opportunity for them to develop resistance. So it's an extremely effective treatment in many cases. But unfortunately, some of the cancers are not cured by radiotherapy. And there are two main reasons for that. In some cases, those tumours are too close to critical structures in the body that would be damaged if we gave the full dose of radiotherapy. And in other examples, the cancer cells themselves might be resistant to radiotherapy. So these are the two things we need to address if we're going to cure more patients with cancer. So here we've got an example of a rather advanced case of lung cancer 
So here's the primary tumour in the lung, and it's spread to the lymph glands, which are at the centre of the chest. And then if we're to treat this patient, we have to encompass all of this, which means treating some of the heart, we're close to the spinal cord, the esophagus that we swallow through is right in there, and the lungs themselves. So all of that limits the amount of treatment that we can safely give. So this is an example of a cancer that's too close to critical structures. Another example is the kind of cancer that I treat, that most of my patients have, which is a brain tumour called glioblastoma. So here's an MRI scan of a brain, and you can all see this tumour. It's showing up very clearly as the white area. Now, the neurosurgeons may be able to take away quite a bit of that tumour, but we know that the tumour cells will have actually infiltrated the brain around that region. And you can see it's a different colour, that darker grey, than the normal brain. And that's because it's got tumour cells within it. Now, the surgeon can't remove them because that's functioning critical brain. And also, the cells of this cancer type are really resistant to radiotherapy. So we've got a double whammy there. It's in a critical tissue, and the cells are resistant. So I'm going to talk about how we tackle both of these issues uh, and give a couple of examples of where we're using drugs uh, with radiotherapy to try and improve the outcomes. Okay. If the tumour is too close to critical structures, we would be able to do better if we could give more precise radiotherapy. And to illustrate where we're going with that and how much progress we've made, I'm going to go back a, a little while and show you how we used to give radiotherapy. So the first patient was treated with radiotherapy in 1896. And this is, oops, sorry, this is uh, early in the last century, early 1900s, and these ladies who've probably got skin cancer are being treated. You can see that their heads are clamped to keep them still. And these are actually cathode ray tubes which make x-rays. And they're essentially dangling near, near the patient's head in the hope that the x-rays will hit the tumour. Now, we can smile about it, but actually quite a lot of patients with skin cancer were cured with this kind of treatment. But these um, x-rays were unable to penetrate further into the body. So it was only really skin cancers that we could treat with this kind of setup. Later on in the 1900s, um, we started using cobalt, which is a radioactive material that emits higher energy uh, rays, which can penetrate a bit deeper. And we started to develop technology that could direct them more precisely in a certain direction. And then this development in the sort of 1950s and 60s enabled us to start rotating that beam around the patient and shine the rays from different angles. So these are different ways to make the radiotherapy a bit more effective. But we had a long way to go in terms of how we planned the treatment and in terms of the confidence with which we could target the tumours. So I'm going to take you through the recent developments in that field. So from about 1950 onwards, we were using two-dimensional radiotherapy. So we'd take an x-ray, which would enable us to see the lung cancer there. We also knew that the lymph glands here were involved, so we had to treat all of that. So we essentially made a shape, and we shone the beams from the front and from the back, so we get an even distribution of dose across that area. So we were able to treat some tumours in that way, but we weren't really focusing the dose on the tumour. So this patient who's had a good response to treatment in terms of the cancer, you can see that the this is quite annoying. Um, you can see that the lung has been very severely damaged by that treatment because the rays, the X-rays are passing right through the lung <coughs> to get to the tumour, and that's all scar tissue in the lung. So this had its drawbacks. From here we moved on to 3D conformal radiotherapy, and here instead of an X-ray, we're using a CT scan to show us where the tumour is, which is here, and enable us to determine which part of the body we want to focus our dose. And instead of using two fields now, we're using three or sometimes more fields coming in at different angles to concentrate the dose on this tumour. And by doing that, we can reduce the dose to the spinal cord here, the heart, and the lungs. 
But if you look carefully, you'll see that the tumour's here, and there's quite a wide margin around it that we're also treating to the maximum dose. The reason for that is this tumour's in the lung, so the patient's going to be breathing while they have the treatment, and that tumour's going to be moving. With that current x-rays that we had at this time, the um, radiotherapy machines, we weren't able to visualise that. So we essentially had to estimate where is that tumour likely to move while the patient's having treatment. And let's enlarge our treatment area to encompass that. So we were treating much more of the patient than we actually needed to. So the next big step forward, and this is really what we're using now, started to introduce a fourth dimension, which is time. So this, um, for this kind of treatment, we actually take CT scans of the patient while they're breathing. So we can see where that tumour moves throughout their breathing cycle. So we have much more confidence about where it's going to be, and we can create a much smaller margin around it. In addition to that, we start to use so-called ARC therapy, where the treatment machine rotates around the patient while it's delivering the beam. And we use something called intensity modulated treatment to give us these very accurate um, dose distributions around the tumour. And the final development has been to build in CT scanners into our radiotherapy machines so we can take an image of the patient immediately before we treat them. So we know exactly where that tumour is on that day, at that particular time, and adapt our treatment if necessary so that we're still hitting the target. So these are some of the developments in technical radiotherapy that have massively increased our accuracy and are enabling us to treat more cancers with a curative dose than we used to because we can avoid the healthy tissues more reliably. Just one other example of that which is relevant to brain tumours Unfortunately, some patients with cancer have spread of that tumour to the brain. And we call that brain metastases. And the way we used to treat that was with this two-dimensional treatment where we're essentially treating the entire brain with two parallel fields of X-rays. The side effects from this treatment are pretty horrific, and it's not particularly effective. So a big advance in the last 20 years has been something called stereotactic radiotherapy, where we can treat within the brain with pinpoint accuracy. And now we're treating up to 10 separate deposits within the brain with this highly accurate precision treatment. It's more effective and it has much fewer side effects. So we've really made massive improvements in our radiotherapy technology. Uh, and the patients benefit because we cure more of the cancers and we cause fewer side effects. So a typical patient having radiotherapy, for example a brain tumour, will have a special face mask made which will enable them to be immobilised for accuracy. They'll then have a CT scan in their treatment position and we'll use that CT scan to plan their treatment and then each day they'll come in, they'll be on a treatment couch with their mask on, immobilised and we'll use lasers to set them up in exactly the same position every day. And then our treatment machine will rotate around them delivering a very accurate treatment. So this is state-of-the-art linear accelerator, which is how we deliver radiotherapy in 2019. So this is where the beam comes down, and this can rotate all the way around the patient. This treatment couch can move back and forwards, up and down, side to side, to get the patient exactly the right spot. And all these panels and accessories are enabling us to take pictures and images of the patient as they breathe, uh, during the treatment before and after. So this is state-of-the-art treatment uh, with radiotherapy. But even with that, we still have patients who can't be cured. And some of the reasons for that are actually the treatment, the tumours actually within our critical structure, structures. There's no way we can avoid them, even with the most technically advanced treatment. And that's the case for these glioblastoma patients where the tumour is actually infiltrating the healthy brain. And that other problem I mentioned before, that even if we can deliver a certain amount of radiotherapy, those cells are going to be resistant, and we need to somehow intensify that treatment. And this is where the drugs come in. So my theory, really, is that we can increase cancer cure rates significantly further 
by combining our new precision radiotherapy with some of these exciting new drugs that targets particular molecules within the cancer cells. So I'm going to give you two examples of different types of drugs that we use with radiotherapy. This is an evolving field, so we don't have many definitive results yet, but I'll give you some examples of where we're going. The way I approached this problem was thinking about how does radiotherapy work? How does it kill the cancer cells? And we know that, and it's pretty straightforward. Radiotherapy kills cells by damaging their DNA. So DNA is the genetic material. Um, it's a double-stranded molecule, which you can see here, which contains the entire genetic code for life. Pretty astounding molecule. And it's packaged up into chromosomes, which live in the nucleus of cells, healthy cells and cancer cells. The DNA is often quite abnormal in cancer cells, and the nucleus of cancer cells often look quite abnormal as well. And that's one of the reasons that radiotherapy works for cancer, is that their DNA is abnormal to begin with, so they're mo it's more susceptible to radiotherapy which damages that DNA. But we can make that difference even more pronounced if we use clever drugs. So just remember that this molecule has got two strands, and the backbone shown here give the physical integrity of the molecule, and the bits in the middle are the genetic code. So when we give radiotherapy to a cell, we cause lots of types of damage, but the most important is to the DNA. And here we've kind of straightened out that DNA molecule to make it clearer. So we cause single-stranded breaks, where just one of the backbones <coughs> is broken, and we cause a lot of those with radiotherapy. And occasionally we cause a double strand break with our radiotherapy, where we've lost both of the backbones at the same place. It's those double strand breaks that will actually kill a cell if they're not repaired. So the cells have opportunities and they have lots of pathways and equipment to try and repair that damage. If they don't repair it, that's when they die. And we can see that in action if we look at cells when they're dividing. So here's a microscopy image of a cell in the actual act of dividing. We call that mitosis. And here the DNA is all stained in blue. And it's all lined up along the middle of the cell. And then these spindles form, which are like fibres, which then pull the DNA apart to create two new cells. And the exact same amount of DNA is taken into each of the new cells. It's a very precise action. If we've damaged that cell and caused double strand breaks in the chromosomes, when the cell tries to divide, it all goes to pieces, literally. And this is how cancer cells die after radiotherapy. We call it mitotic catastrophe. And I always tell the students it's my favourite form of cell death. And you can see what's happening here. The cell is attempting to divide, but this DNA is going all over the place, fragmenting, and the cell dies. That only happens if they've got double strand breaks that are not repaired. So, the reason we don't cure our cancers is that some of the cells can survive the radiotherapy, and to do that, they have to repair their DNA. And we know quite a lot about how that's done. And in fact, a lot of this research has been done in the UK. So this is where it starts getting a bit complicated, but you don't need to understand any of the details of these pathways. So single-stranded breaks are repaired by this pathway, which has got two parallel parts to it. And double-strand breaks are repaired by at least one other pathway, and you can see all these different molecules are involved in repairing these damage. Why is this of use? Well, we've got drugs now that can stop the activity of some of these molecules in these pathways. And I'm going to talk about two of them. So one of them is PARP inhibitors. So this molecule, PARP, poly-ADP ribose polymerase, is an important molecule in this single-strand break repair pathway, and that's my favourite DNA repair protein. And we've got really good drugs for inhibiting that. And to inhibit double-strand break repair, we can inhibit this protein called DNAPK. So these drugs work really well. 
And we expect that if we combine them with radiotherapy, we're going to get more DNA damage and maybe kill more cells. So what happens if we block the double-strand break repair pathway? Well, these are the crucial lesions, so we might expect quite a big effect if we add a DNA-PK inhibitor to radiotherapy. And we do. We get a big increase in death of cells. But that affects all the cells. It affects the healthy cells as well as the cancer cells. And if we were to combine radiotherapy in a patient with a DNA-PK inhibitor, I expect that we would get quite a big increase in side effects. And here's an example in the brain where the radiotherapy can actually damage the brain permanently. So I think this is a bad idea. What we need is a drug that only increases the effects of radiotherapy on the cancer cells. So in my tumour, there's a real obvious difference between the cancer cells that we're treating with radiotherapy and the normal cells that are in that area. The cancer cells are rapidly dividing, these two different tumours, but the cells of the normal brain hardly ever divide. So that gives us an opportunity. And this is the work that I did in my PhD and I've been working on ever since really. So if we block single strand break repair with a PARP inhibitor, two different things are going to happen depending on when the cells are, whether the cells are dividing or non-dividing. And in this example, the cancer cells are dividing and the normal brain cells are not dividing. So in the presence of a PARP inhibitor, after radiotherapy, the single strand breaks are not going to be repaired. And as those cells divide, they get converted into double strand breaks. And in fact, those double strand breaks seem to be particularly difficult to repair. So in those cancer cells, we get excess double strand breaks and we kill more of the cells through mitotic catastrophe. So in theory, that gives us a higher chance of curing those tumours. In the non-dividing cells, they're not replicating their DNA. They don't need to because they're not going to divide. So those single strand breaks firstly never get converted to double strand breaks. And what we've observed is that other pathways can come in and repair them more slowly, but they still get repaired. So what we expect is that there will be no effects of adding the PARP inhibitor to radiotherapy in the healthy brain. What about other cancer types? Well, in general, when we give radiotherapy, we see two different types of side effects. The first group are called the acute side effects. They occur in tissues with rapidly proliferating cells. They occur during radiotherapy, and they pretty much always completely heal afterwards. They can be pretty nasty. This is the mouth uh, with bad inflammation and ulceration. This is the esophagus, the gullet with some inflammation. This is the skin. It can be nasty during the treatment, but they usually heal afterwards, almost always. And then we've got the late side effects, which we are really very worried about. They occur in tissues that are not proliferating, like the brain, some of the lung tissue, or some of the skin. This is the deeper structures of the skin. And we don't see them until months or even years after radiotherapy. But if they happen, they're irreversible. So we absolutely don't want these. Now, these pictures look pretty frightening. But this is from old-fashioned radiotherapy, when we were not giving very precise treatments. We don't really see these side effects anymore, but we know that we mustn't cause them uh, if we are adding drugs to our radiotherapy. So people have been combining PARP inhibitors with radiotherapy in various different cancer types, and we're beginning to get to grips with what happens when we do this. So the first trial, this is the PARP inhibitor that we've been using. It's called Alaparib given as a tablet, very easy to take. So if you add that to radiotherapy for lung cancer patients, and this is a phase one study, so the first time this combination's ever been tested, and what we do is start off with a very low dose and see how high you can take it through successive patients. So this study really struggled, and a lot of the patients experienced severe inflammation of their esophagus, preventing them from swallowing. And essentially, at the end of that trial, they found out they could give this dose 25 milligrams per day. 
And what they saw was adding the PARP inhibitor increased the acute side effects in the esophagus where there are rapidly proliferating cells. Around the same time, other people in the US were studying alaparib and radiotherapy in cancers of the tonsil and the larynx, the voice box here. And again, they saw severe inflammation of the mouth and the throat in all the patients. And they were able to give 50 milligrams of this drug per day. And again, they saw an increase in acute side effects in rapidly proliferating tissues. What we did was combine it with radiotherapy in patients with glioblastoma, which is what I've been wanting to do ever since my PhD, and it's taken me over a decade to do it for various reasons. And we've now finished our dose escalation study, and in the brain we saw no increase in side effects. And we were able to give 600 milligrams of this drug per day. So that's over 12 times more than the other people could give when they were giving the radiotherapy to different parts of the body. And the reason is that in the brain, there are no proliferating cells. So we're not going to see an increase in side effects because we only see it when cells are dividing. So taking all these results together, what we can essentially say is that the results in patients confirm what we'd seen in the lab. So PARP inhibitors do increase the effects of radiotherapy but only in rapidly dividing cells. There is absolutely no effect on the non-dividing cells in the normal brain. So we've now got later phase trials underway where we'll actually be able to see if the drugs improve life expectancy for patients with glioblastoma. And we're also looking at it in pancreatic cancer and some other cancers as well. So we've talked about tackling the root cause uh, or the root mechanism by which radiotherapy kills cells through this DNA damage response. I'm just going to briefly talk about one other situation. And this involves the immune system. And this is a very exciting new area of cancer research which has really blown up over the last 10 years. So as I mentioned, cancer cells are really abnormal. This is one which has got a massive nucleus full of all kinds of abnormal genetic mutations and structures. And in theory, these mutations create molecules within the cell which are foreign to the person that, in which that cancer has grown. So those molecules should activate the immune system. They shouldn't be there. So the patient's immune system shouldn't tolerate them. And yet, for reasons we are now beginning to understand, the immune system is pretty ineffective at tackling cancer. And the big breakthrough in this field came about 10 years ago, when people, first of all, worked out that all the time, all of us are actively suppressing our immune system. We're stopping it from attacking our own tissue. And actually, cancers have hijacked that process. So they, they actively suppress the immune system around them to stop the immune system from killing, them, killing those cancer cells. It's quite a sinister uh, observation, but it seems to happen in nearly all cancers. So the cancers are growing, and as they're growing, they're stopping the immune system from attacking them. The other thing that we've noticed in the last decade or so is that radiotherapy can actually increase the release of foreign molecules from cancer cells, and it should be capable of activating the immune system. But it doesn't because the cancer is busy suppressing the immune system. So this slide gets a little bit complicated, and you don't really need to worry about all of it. Essentially, just to, to say that when we treat a tumour with radiotherapy, we cause two things, as well as killing some of the cells. We cause a release of so-called tumour antigens and release of other molecules called danger signals, which help to activate the immune system. The activation takes place in lymph nodes around the cancer, and if successful, 
it creates a whole army of immune cells which are capable of attacking the tumour where the signal originally came from. And most exciting of all, if the cancer is spread elsewhere, those immune cells in theory should also be capable of attacking the metastasis. Now as I've said, that's all in theory and it doesn't usually happen. What's so exciting now is that we have drugs that can stop the cancer from suppressing the immune system. And another way of looking at it is that those drugs which are called immune checkpoint inhibitors can unlock that effect of radiotherapy on the immune response. We can look at that in a slightly different way. So here's a patient with a cancer that spread to other sites. We are using these immune checkpoint inhibitors without radiotherapy, but most of the time they're not particularly effective. If the patient isn't responding to that drug, we can try to make it respond by giving radiotherapy to the cancer. And what that, in theory, does is convert the cancer from what we call a cold tumour that isn't activating the immune system into a hot tumour that is activating the immune system because of these tumour antigens and these danger signals that get released. And if that all works, by combining radiotherapy with this drug, the immune checkpoint inhibitor, we should increase the effect of the treatment on the primary cancer that we're actually giving the radiotherapy to, but we might also get an improvement in response at other parts, in other parts of the body. And this is a whole different way of using radiotherapy, something that most of us never even imagined would be possible. So does it work? Well, this is quite interesting. This is new research, but the drug companies loved all of this, and they piled into it with billions and billions of pounds. And it has gone really quickly into the clinic, unlike the area I've been struggling in for a decade and a half, where we're sort of making very slow progress. Anyway, when drug companies really get behind something, they move fast. So here's a trial of patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. That's the commonest type of lung cancer. So these are advanced cancers which are treated with radiotherapy as well as chemotherapy drugs. And that's the standard treatment. So in this trial, all the patients got that standard treatment. Radiotherapy was the main part of it. And then when they were finished, they either got this drug, Dervalimab, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor, or they got a placebo. And perhaps to many people's surprise, this first trial that was really done showed that the patients who got the drug lived longer than the patients who didn't get the drug. They'd already finished their radiotherapy, so this drug given after radiotherapy was enabling them to live longer. And we think it's because it activated the immune system to attack those cells that hadn't been cleared up by the radiotherapy. And the other intriguing part of this trial was they looked at whether the patients went on to get metastases in other sites of the body. And what they saw was an even bigger effect of that drug in preventing metastases. I won't go into the details of how the graph is presented, but essentially the patients who got the drug were much less likely to develop metastases, which means that this idea that it's working on other parts of the tumour which you didn't give radiotherapy to seems to potentially be true. So really exciting. Two whole new different ways of tackling cancer by combining radiotherapy with drugs. So I'm going to finish there with some take-home messages, slightly controversial. Radiotherapy is often curative, unlike most cancer drugs. And there are some examples that I've told you about and many tens of thousands of patients every year who are cured with radiotherapy. However, some tumours are not cured and it's either because they're in the wrong place or because the cells are resistant to the radiotherapy. We can overcome that problem and improve our cure rates firstly by making our radiotherapy more precise 
and that deals predominantly with the issue of tumour location, but also by combining it with drugs to overcome this problem of resistance. And we've seen that drugs that block DNA repair are beginning to show promise in some cancers. They're a bit tricky to use in other cancers, so we need to do that in a very sensible way. And then we're beginning to get some really exciting results with this new class of drugs, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, that promote an immune response to radiotherapy-treated cancers. So I'll finish there, and I would be delighted to take any questions.